Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our very special webinar with Dr. Patrick Dixon. And so we're all in, in different locations and uh, rejoicing again that we have the opportunity to do this through the technology, which is one of the things we've discovered in, in COVID, how to use that. And so it's a delight to have Dr. Patrick Dixon with us. And so he's just going to bring a greeting now and uh, just a few words about what he's doing. Okay, well, it's great to be with you and uh, the Kensington Temple family again, and uh, just so so delighted to connect in this strange way. It, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on, how how uh, how uh, Christian ministries have um, just flourished in all kinds of uh, unexpected directions through this virtual channel. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Patrick Dixon, medical doctor, futurist adventurer, expert in viruses. Well, it's, a quite, it's quite a long list. Yeah, uh, yes, well, it's, you know, it's, uh, we, I guess it's, it's a sign of old age, isn't it? When <laughs> gray hairs. <laughs> so I started off as a physician, cancer doctor, looking after people dying in London um, and uh, um, being involved in church life as well. Um, and then HIV, another mutant virus, uh, it's a similar story to COVID in a way. It jumped from animals into humans unexpectedly about 35 to 40 years ago. And that particular virus hijacked my medical practice, Colin. I was completely overwhelmed as a young 30 year old doctor looking after people in hospices and at home. And suddenly this is new virus. It's filling up London wards in, in hospitals uh, uh, very rapidly. We didn't understand it. We were, uh, lots of people were very scared of it. Um, we had no treatment, no cure, no vaccine. Um, it, was, it was a really huge time. And that led to a, an organization starting um, through churches in London called Asset AIDS Care Education and Training. And that's still running today. And we have programs all over the world. But because of that work as, as a doctor who had then been confronted with a mutant virus, of course, that's made me, as you can imagine, Colin, very sensitive to the yeah. thought that history might repeat. And so for years now, decades, I've been warning that uh, we could well find ourselves on the edge of another terrible pandemic. If you think that HIV, you know, we have 38 million people carrying the virus today, we have had another 30 to 4 million deaths, and we've had 1.7 million new people infected in the last year alone. You know, I've seen the immense threats that can come from these viruses, and then of course, COVID-19. Well, I remember um, back in that day, uh, meeting you a little bit in early stages of that of that journey you've just described. And um, I do actually recall you speaking to us, I think it was at Kensington Temple, about the whole nature of viruses um, and uh, talking about a virus like that, HIV AIDS, of course, is transmitted through bodily fluids. It's not it's not quite the same as COVID, but I do recall you saying we have to be ready and prepared because these viruses can come thick and fast. And can you imagine if they become yeah. airborne infections? Mm. And so in many ways, you have been thinking about this for a long time. Yes. So you can imagine that when a lockdown happened, that uh, um, many of the companies I've worked with in the past, uh, helping them to understand global trends, which is now the bulk of what I do, um, were on the phone you know, quite quickly looking for advice on how to navigate this time of tremendous uncertainty and challenge. Well, we're so grateful that you joined us tonight. And um, as you know, we've had quite a few questions that come in by email and the other ways of asking questions and participating. So I'm going to hand over to Ron Salamat, who is our host for this evening. He's going to take you through what we need to do. Thank you so much, Colin. And Hello, everyone. Great to have you at this webinar with us. And hello, Patrick. Great to see you again. Patrick, you I have done some in the past. Um, my role is fairly easy today. And uh, what I wanted to explain to you is how it works to get you more involved in the webinar. Thank you for the many of you who sent in questions. We have many questions and many good questions. We have um, a number of panelists. You can see their faces on the screen. If you're in the webinar, it's uh, along with uh, Colin and Patrick. We've got Jonathan Gwilt, Amanda, Davinda, Claudette, uh, Eddie Walsh, Marcelo, Pastor Andrew, and uh, Pastor Scott. 
So um, there's a number of ways you can interact with us today. If you're in the webinar, you can dialogue with us on chat and members of the panel will be chatting with you. Or if you're in the webinar, you can also use the Q&A function and that way we'll be responding to you as well from the panel. I noticed a couple of people have raised their hands already. And so just to let you know, the way the evening is gonna flow is Patrick is gonna address us for a few minutes and then he's gonna start answering some of the questions that have already come in. But if you keep sending your questions in to us, we'll make sure that somehow we channel them through him and, and we'll handle as many of these as we can in the time we've got allocated. If you've come in on Facebook or YouTube, we have staff members who are monitoring those platforms as well. So feel free to ask your questions on YouTube and Facebook and they will find a way of relaying your questions to us. But if you're on Facebook or YouTube and you'd prefer to join us in the webinar, the webinar ID 819-0890-2984. Again, if you wanted to pop into the webinar, remember the webinar offers you the facilities to chat back and forth with us. With us. If you'd prefer 819-0890-2984. So as I indicated earlier on, we are so pleased to have uh, Patrick Dixon with us today. And so Patrick, it's over to you. Oh, well, thank you. What I thought I'd do is just share some initial thoughts. And yes, thank you for the questions you've already put here. Um, I promise we'll answer all the ones we've got already um, and we'll do our very best with the rest. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm very happy to linger at the end for a cup of coffee, even after the session's formally finished and we'll just do what we can. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, so we all count to 10 and see whether this is actually going to work or not. And hopefully it does. Can you see that? Uh, hang on. Matt, did, well, no, what, did that not work? Let me just try again. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Keynote. Play. Now, can you see that, folks? No, we cannot see that. Okay. Uh, let me just... Ah, oh, hang on. I see why. Let me just see. Uh, share, screen sharing has failed to start. Let's try again. Okay, let's try one more time. Okay, let me just try one more time. Technology is great. <laughs> and we're very grateful for it. And uh, we've got a tech team on, on hand if they need to talk you through anything. All but right. Let's just see okay, how so let me just try this instead. There we okay. go. There we go. All right. There we go. So hopefully now you can see. Yes. Are oh, we doing good? Right? You got that. Fine. So um, I, what I want to do is to take us through uh, some thoughts about the pandemic. And what I'd say is this. It's very easy to be blind. Jesus criticized the leaders of the day because they did not know how to interpret the signs of the time. So let's have a look at the signs of the times and try and understand what they might mean. The first thing I'd say is this, that there's nothing particularly new about COVID-19. I've already said that uh, I had the experience of HIV, another mutant virus, and trying to care for people with that particular condition over 32 years ago. Uh, new viruses emerge somewhere in the world very regularly and existing viruses are mutating all the time. So just uh, look, at, look at this, in 2003 we had SARS as a virus, another type of coronavirus actually, which was killed 10%. That's one in 10 of all those who had it, young and old. I have to say, I'm so grateful that the, this particular virus is not killing tiny children because many of these viruses do. They go for the very, very old who are vulnerable and the very, very young who are vulnerable. Um, in bird flu, uh, hit us also in 2003. That was causing 60% mortality rate. We had swine flu in 2009, very low mortality rate, but it spread very fast. Half of the world's entire children became infected in just 12 months. Uh, in 2012, we were hit by MERS, especially in the Middle East. This killed one third of all the people that became infected and now COVID. So 
Now, when we look at, uh, you know, today is World AIDS Day, actually, December the 1st, it's the time we, we, re we remember those who have died and we consider the sobering realities of HIV, the fact that uh, this is a different mutant virus, but nevertheless jumped from animals into humans. Last year, it caused 1.7 million new infections, 690,000 deaths, 38 million people living with it. But I just want you to see that actually we are getting control of that slowly. Uh, we have treatment now for most people in the world who have HIV, which has turned this from a deadly disease into a chronic one. Now, when we look at COVID, for those of you who like graphs, I just want you to notice one thing. Uh, on, the, on the top is the global situation, the number of new cases each, uh, each week. And uh, you'll see that it was fairly flat from June all the way through to September and then started to rise. Um, if you look at the number of deaths, it's actually been relatively constant. The reason why that's important is that it's, it actually spread more slowly than we expected. You know, in London, uh, during the uh, fastest growth of the uh, infection in, let's say, late March, early April, we were seeing cases double every two days. That is two days to go from one case to a thousand in an area. Uh, sorry, two days to go from one to two, two days from two to four, two days from four to eight. The trouble is after the ninth day, you have 500 cases. And then on the 10th day, you go to a thousand cases. And in another 10 days after that, um, sorry, with 10 doublings, you go from uh, you go from two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. It goes on climbing very quickly. And so if you have a doubling time of two days, then in 20 days, that's 10 doublings. So you go from one case to a thousand. And in another 20 days, in London's case, you go theoretically from a thousand to a million. It spread so fast. And in many European countries, we saw a doubling time of around four days. Now that's compared to with HIV and AIDS. It, back 30 years ago, we were seeing doubling times of a year in many parts of the world. So you can see this was spreading very fast. But in the UK, um, you'll see that we are seeing things come back down again uh, with, with lockdown. So that's, that's some good news. What's really interesting is that Research has been coming through for some months now. For about six months, I've been following a story about common colds. We first started to see uh, laboratory results suggesting that if you look at uh, serum from people who have had common colds in the past, and this serum was sitting in, in, in the freezer, <laughs> and we, scientists defrosted it to see whether the serum from people who'd had colds some years ago might also protect them against. COVID-19 virus. And they found that in the laboratory, there seemed to be some in protection to some degree in, in, in quite a few cases. And similar studies were, were came out in Cell, in Nature, in other um, scientific publications. And more recently, another study came out suggesting that if you live in a house with lots of young children, maybe those over the age of eight, it's actually statistically less likely that you'll get sick from COVID and much less likely that you'll die. Uh, why would that be? Well, it seems that there is um, this particular coronavirus um, shares some properties with other coronaviruses that cause common cold. And it may be that if you have been experienced to lots and lots of common colds in the past, um, then some parts of your immune system may just recognize the COVID-19 virus more quickly. Now, at the same time, as I said, viruses mutate, and we have seen a mutant emerge in Denmark uh, in uh, workers who've been handling mink animals. Uh, they've been uh, grown for their fur coats, and the Danish government is so concerned about this that they actually slaughtered 17 million animals because they, they could see a new mutant had emerged, that the COVID-19 had jumped from an animal in the first place into humans, had spread rapidly, jumped from humans into mink and mutated, and then jumped back into humans in a slightly different form. And the worry is that you then have a sort of minked version of COVID, which hits you again. You get a human version of COVID, and then three weeks later, a mink version of COVID, because your human antibody 
your, your antibodies against the human version don't necessarily give you very good protection against this other one. So that is a constant hazard for us. The other problem, and these are the mink, some of the mink, the other problem is when we're thinking about vaccines is that we don't know how long immunity lasts anyway. So I have two members of my own family who are in the front line against COVID-19. One works in intensive care and the other works as a hospital nurse. Both of them, they think, have had COVID twice. Uh, the, the, my relative, who's, who's a nurse, had good antibodies. She had a proven COVID infection in May. She had good antibody response. Her antibody levels remained high in June, July, August. By September, they were falling and October, she's sick again. So that's the challenge. Many coronaviruses that cause common colds and things like that, they don't produce a long lasting immunity. So when we get very excited about vaccines, if we, if we are getting excited about them, we need to remember that if a vaccine gives you um, the same immune response as if you'd had COVID-19, it may simply mean that you've got six months protection, maybe not much more than that. So we need to be quite cautious, even though the progress has been absolutely incredible. We have never seen a vaccine produced in less than four years in the past, but here we have 53 different vaccines. Four of them already have completed clinical trials. But as I say, we've got questions about how long immunity lasts. Now, what this really shows is that and there's something very wrong with, uh, with, 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 uh, with medical knowledge. You see, it was in the 1940s that Alexander Fleming discovered the first antibiotic, penicillin. And at that moment, uh, began a tremendous, exciting journey. It meant that if your you know, son or daughter today has a bacterial meningitis or bacterial pneumonia, they will go to maybe a London teaching hospital, they get pumped full of antibiotics and three or four days, they're completely better, they're cured and home they go. But with antivirals, we don't have today a single antiviral that is as effective against a single virus anywhere in the world as penicillin was against uh, various bacteria. So we have a great big hole in the medical cabinets of teaching hospitals, uh, in chemists uh, and everywhere else. We desperately need much better antivirals because we can't really allow our world to be held to ransom for a year or so every time a new mutant goes pandemic because it takes such a colossal effort to develop a vaccine. We have to be locked down while we're doing it. Uh, it costs gigantic economic disruption. How much better it would be if a new virus emerges next year, we just go and get the equivalent of penicillin and people are cured. So that's a big area for medical research. But I, I want to turn to uh, some, some, some thoughts about the wider impact, because I, th I think it's very important. And as Christians, I hope this is encouraging to us that in the midst of all the suffering we have seen and all the, um, in, the negative impacts on people's mental and emotional well-being, in the middle of all of that, we have seen in many countries an outpouring of public spiritedness, of a desire to help, of gratefulness for the small things of life, whether it's the setting of a sun, or watching the rain fall, or just being able to see a friend, even from a distance. Small things have really mattered. And I was excited, encouraged in the midst of all of this pain and much tragedy to see that over a million people volunteered to become supporters of the National Health Service in just one week, in just one country, the UK. How wonderful is that? And at the same time, the kind of things that people like Greta Thunberg have been talking about for a long time to do with climate change or the protection of the environment or um, plastics in the oceans. What has happened is that in many countries, people have become more thoughtful. They're thinking, actually, how do we live? And is this happening to us because somehow human beings have gone out of control? Uh, should we be listening to what our planet is trying to tell us, indeed what our maker is telling us about 
life, about what really matters, about what's ultimately important. And, you know, there was a survey done by the Guardian newspaper in partnership with Tear Fund. If you're watching from outside the UK, that's one of our main national newspapers. And Tear Fund is the fifth largest development agency in the country as an evangelical organization. And they did a poll together and they discovered that a third of all 18 to 35 year olds had been watching online church services in the previous six weeks. Folks, think about it, a third. Um, and it was uh, similar figures for all the other age groups. And if you look at, uh, uh, say, the, the church below, which is the one where, where uh, we're worshipping at the moment in Weymouth, and um, you'll see 139, 164, 178 views of a, of, a, of a church service. Actually, that's been happening, even though we've now started to have meetings in the church you know, for quiet prayer and things like that when we've been allowed to, um, and other things going on. But the, I could tell you that there are only 100 members of the church, so you only need 70 views for everyone to take part in a church service because, uh, of course, you, on some, uh, in some homes you have two or three or four people watching and others maybe only one. So if only 70 of those views there belong to us, then who are these others? And they are some of the people who are on this headline here. They are people who are dropping by from all over the world, from all walks of life, for all kinds of reasons. And why? Because something is happening to them. Their world has changed and they are becoming more thoughtful about the environment, about volunteering, about how to build a better world, just thinking about their own futures. And I just conclude with this, uh, this, this, this final thought and then back to you, uh, which is this, that I often think about the life of the Apostle Paul uh, who was locked up, locked down, locked in for so much of his ministry. I think of him as someone frustrated, uh, crying out in his prayer life to God, wondering why, why, Lord, have you prevented me from giving my ministry? Lord, you created me as a teacher, as a church planter, as an apostle, as an evangelist. How can I do that when I'm here locked up in a prison? And you, then you, you can almost hear Paul thinking in his letters. He begins to think about maybe witnessing to the jailers or to a few visitors who come. And, and, but still, you, ca you get his frustration, uh, the cry from his heart for the churches he loves. And I wonder at what point it suddenly dawned on him that actually he had in his cell paper and ink and he could write. But what could he write? And would the letter arrive on the back of a donkey or on a ship or a boat? And even if it did, how many people would read it? But still he began to write as an act of obedience because he was locked down, locked up, locked in and totally frustrated. And out of that, he became the world's first time warp apostle, the first digital church planter and evangelist, the first um, the first digital preacher, the, the greatest online Christian influence the world has ever known. The fact is, I'm talking about the ministry of Paul now. And I often think that if he hadn't been locked down, locked up, locked in, and if he hadn't been frustrated out of his brain, thinking about how to somehow escape the confines of his cell, I wonder if our world would ever have benefited it from his ministry in the way that we do today. And I say that to encourage us as the church, especially when you're looking at the online services and, and things like that, you say, well, it's not as good as doing it face to face. That is true. But something extraordinary has happened across the whole world. And I just give you one final example of that, which I'll just share as a story from the world of Asset, the AIDS Foundation. I remember, um, uh, 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 last year, we had a small number of people together, 50 from all over the world. Some people couldn't come from Uganda or Congo because the British government would not give them visas. But we still met, we rejoiced, we had fellowship, we prayed together, and we've met in different countries doing the same as finances allow. 
Anyway, in lockdown, uh, some sort of elders of the movement, sort of four or five of us have been continuing to meet and pray on a regular basis for the movement. And one of them in Uganda said, he said, you know, in Uganda, we're having our team meetings as usual. Even in the most remote rural areas, we are gathering on Zoom. He said, we're missing something. We should have a big international conference like the last one we had in my country. He said, in Uganda, in 2008, we welcomed 34 nations, 135 people. He said, we should do that this month. So we scratched our heads and thought, well, why not? If they can do it in Uganda, let's do it in Congo. Let's do it in Zimbabwe and let's do it in Russia. And do you know, five weeks later, Asset held a conference and what a joy it was. Locked down, locked in, locked up and frustrated out of our brains, there we were. 35 nations, 135 people. We were sharing best practice, sharing stories of encouragement. We were thinking through what COVID means to people who know how to fight viruses, because that's what ACID has done for the last 32 years. What can we take from that ministry and help the world with now? Uh, we start, we sang, we worshiped, we broke bread together, we prayed, and for four hours we had a taste I believe of heaven itself. What a joy it was that to be provoked by that brother in, in Uganda. And I often think about St. Paul, if St. Paul, not locked down, not locked in, and we'd never have had his ministry. If we hadn't been locked up, we'd have never done that conference. You know what, out of that, the country leader said, let's pray every week. So we've then been meeting to pray every week. It's the highlight of my week, and for Sheila, my wife, uh, on a Wednesday morning, uh, for an hour, we have no idea who will turn up, but leaders from the movement from all over the world, it might be someone from the from most rural part of Zimbabwe, another one from Thailand, or another one uh, from, the, from Czech Republic or from uh, Ukraine, but turning up, and even though we're virtual and we can't give each other a hug, we learn about each other's stories, we stand together and we pray together. I tell you, it has been life-changing and so I just want to say, let's look through COVID. My first slide was life beyond COVID. My friends, there is life beyond COVID. So while I'm very happy to discuss 4,323 questions we already have, <laughs> let's not lose the plot here. And let's consider why it is that we might have been locked down, locked up and locked in and make the very best because all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes as Paul has written. Okay, back to you. I don't know. Ron? Thank you, Ron, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you for that uh, wide-ranging uh, introductory talk there. Now, yeah, we do have some decisions to make because uh, questions have come in, and there are three three main areas, that, as, as I see this. There is the etiology, the, the origin of the virus, uh, yes. exactly help us with how that, how that happened. Um, and there are those who say that it has been deliberately introduced into the population and it has been created in a laboratory. Uh, um, and then there is the actual um, ongoing question about viruses, which is more like prevention and, and dealing with the virus. And then the third main area is about, you know, the future, which is I know where, where your heart really is um, as to what what this lasting legacy this is going to leave for us and for the church in particular. I know you've already touched on that insofar as saying that we have learned, we're doing it now, we're doing it tonight. We're using technology and some of us old guys have got right on the bandwagon with this and we're doing amazing things, things we never thought were possible. And so the future of the church and, and changing in, in connection with global trends. So now how much you go into this will depend very much on you and the questions that are before you. So would you yeah. like, let me just ask you to kick off on okay. the, the origin of the vaccine and then uh, it'd be over to you and Ron to work out where you go from there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, we still don't know where case zero was. Actually, you know what? With HIV, we still don't know either. Um, <laughs> We've been studying that for 40 or 50 years. We have no idea. Uh, and I don't think we ever will. Um, uh, but uh, I remember with HIV, it's a, one of the commonest questions I was asked in churches was, did somebody make this in a laboratory? It's nothing new about this question. I was able to say categorically, no. And I knew that because we knew we could find traces of HIV infection 
hints of it going back a previous decade or two, long be uh, before a time when we ever had the technology to make it. Life's more complicated now, Colin, because actually we do have the technology to make viruses like this or to take an existing virus and mutate it in some way. And we know that lots of, lots of laboratories are doing all kinds of experimental work with viruses um, for all kinds of reasons, including, unfortunately, uh, not necessarily very nice ones. Um, and we have our own laboratory here in the UK called Portland Down, which is designed to try and anticipate threats of viruses being used as weapons of war. So we need to take that seriously. Now, um, I have no idea whether this particular virus um, uh, mutated naturally, as I say, they do anyway every year, Colin, um, uh, or whether this particular one uh, had a helping hand. In other, in other words, it was, it was, you know, someone had been fiddling around in the laboratory and doing various experiments, putting it back in the freezer, and they got themselves infected. I don't know, um, but I wouldn't make too big a deal out of it. One thing I'm certain of, absolutely certain, is that this was not a deliberate act to sort of poison off the earth. Um, at the very worst, it would have been a an experiment that went badly wrong, and probably those who involved in it were the, some of the first people to die. But I just don't know. It seems much more complicated than it first appears. I, I, I'm beginning to see hints of, of infection even in, uh, in Italy, long before it seemed to come up in, in, in China. Honestly, it, I think it's lost in the mists of, mists of time as regards the, the origin. Okay, Ron, would you like to take us further? Or how about Patrick, you, you dealing with some of the questions that are, okay. are, are already yes. before you. All right, yes. Well. There are a whole lot, I have to say, there's a, a lot of questions. I'm very great. I've got some written ones here that were sent in before the seminar began. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with what's happening on the screen here. But um, uh, um, so the people are worried, you know, how long would the antibodies last? I, I really don't know is the answer. And it depends on who you are. Um, and uh, we, we know that the um, antibodies can fall off. There are two parts of the immune system. There's the antibodies, which are just like a chemical your body produces to mop up viruses. Um, but there are T cells. These are soldier cells and they go and attack infected cells. And the T cells um, may, may have a much longer lasting immunity. In fact, in London, um, uh, uh, maybe 17 or 18 percent of, of, of the population has had antibodies uh, to COVID at some time in the last few months. Uh, but it looks like four times as many have got T cells activated. So over half the population of London has probably been exposed already, even though the antibody tests don't show that, but that's another matter. The, matter. the antibody tests, by the way, don't guarantee um, that you, uh, that, you know, if, if you come antibody negative, it doesn't prove that you haven't had it because you could have lost your antibodies. Um, and uh, um, indeed you can test you can be quite sick uh, and test negative for the virus particles. It's complicated. There are two tests. One is for the virus particles, which becomes positive usually quite soon in someone who's, who's unwell, and they, they then disappear as the antibodies start to rise, and then we test for antibodies later on. Um, so the tests aren't, aren't exclusive. Um, I've seen quite a lot of questions we've had about the vaccines. I don't wish you go on to that and ethics of them. Would that be good to do? Uh, yes, yes. Patrick, I would suggest that because we've had a number of questions, even while you're speaking, coming in uh, on the vaccine. It seems like there's two types of, it's converging on two types. Yeah. Um, people are asking the question about um, sample sizes and the length of time yes. over which the vaccines were tested. And secondly, uh, a question around uh, what the content is and whether we as Christians have an ethical dilemma to make some yes. decisions on. Yes, okay, so on the, on the trials, let me just say, uh, I mean, I, I have um, a, a bit of an inside track on this story because uh, I know a lot of people or talk to a lot of people who are involved in, in these kinds of technologies and it is quite extraordinary the speed at which we've been able to go. It's science fiction, I mean, uh, it's a bit like, um, uh, you know, Elon Musk suddenly is sending a, a rocket to a space station and you think that we, it would require the whole of NASA to do it and, and you know, a hundred years of space technology. And then Elon Musk, who just makes a few electric cars, he sends a rocket with human beings to the space station. How does he do that? The technology is growing and we've got the viral equivalent of that now. So 
vaccines, we, 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 we found much faster ways to make vaccines than ever before. Um, have um, some of the traditional safety measures been cut, uh, cut past? No. Um, do we know everything? No. Um, you know, oral, oral contraceptives, the pill has been around since the 1960s. We're still debating some of its health impacts um, because it takes you 40, 50 years to know, <laughs> you know, so the impact on osteoarthritis in women who are 85 years old or the impact on Alzheimer's disease um, uh, you know, and trying to correlate that with how many years someone was on a particular type of oral contraceptive. It could take 50 years to answer a question like that. And it will take 30 years maybe to know everything we need to know about the, the longer term safety of these vaccines. But I think we can be confident, as confident as we are about most new vaccines when they, 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 they come, that, uh, that this, is a, uh, this is a good thing, um, that's, that, the, that some of these vaccines look very, very, uh, very exciting in terms of the response levels. Now, as to the science and whether I personally would take them, okay, because <laughs> that's a big test, isn't it? Um, so as to the science, there are, there are several ways to do this. One is in the usual way is you find a weakened version of the same virus. We did it with smallpox in the olden days. We didn't even have to do any, anything. Um, I don't know if you remember, know the story, but um, it was noticed that some, some that there, was, there were, there were when, when the whole world was getting pox scars all over their faces from smallpox, it was noticed that there were some farmhands on some local farms that had absolutely beautiful skin. And of course, where would you notice that? It was the young girls. He just noticed that most of the young girls in the villages were very, very, very scarred. And these, these girls working farms were not, and they couldn't work out why. And then they worked out that actually there was a, a different kind of virus, cowpox, which was affecting the cows, which the milkmaids were, 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 uh, were catching from the cows. And this gave them a cross immunity to smallpox. So the idea of using a weakened virus or a slightly different one to protect us against the real thing is, is very, very old. It's very effective. And that is what, is in essence, the Oxford AstraZeneca project is, has been trying to do, is to create a, a virus that can't cause illness, can't make you sick, um, and make it in vast quantities very quickly, um, and give you uh, just the virus particles uh, in themselves, nothing else, just the virus particles and make you immune. And the good thing about that particular technology is it's tried and tested, <laughs> it's 30 or 40 years old in different forms, really, in one way or another. Their, their process of manufacturing is faster than and new, but, um, and you can pop it in the fridge for 30 days and, and uh, it's easy to transport. Now, uh, there is a, it, there has been a, a, an ethical question raised, which because people have asked me on the on on, on the questions, I, I'm going to address it in a moment. And uh, the other one is um, an example of it is the Pfizer one uh, on Medina, and this is this is clever stuff. Uh, this involves um, some a tiny tiny scrap of genetic code. It's not the same genes as inside the nucleus of your cells. Okay, that gives you the brain of your cell. Um, it's what they call a messenger RNA. This, it's, um, it's a tiny, tiny fragment, which if it gets inside a cell for a short period of time, issues an instruction, and usually an instruction to make virus particles. And they've just changed it. So instead of producing a whole virus, it just produces a tiny, tiny fragment of the virus, which gets on the outside of the cell, and then your whole immune system goes crazy and says, oh my goodness, what's that? And it produces a massive reaction against what the body thinks is a virus. It isn't. It's just like the, the, you know, it's like the, the fingernails of the virus. And as they react against that, the immune system is primed. So when the real virus comes into the body, this, uh, the, uh, the human body says, I know exactly what those is. I've seen these, these little, little fingernail things before. Wham, done. Now, Christians, what, Christians are, it's, ama it's amazing. You put a thousand Christians in a room and it seems to me that there's some Christians that will find a theological reason for anything or against anything, <laughs> it's quite remarkable. <laughs> the things I've seen justified from, from scripture, from, you know, I mean, honestly, even acts of tremendous evil I've seen justified for, by, by, by people from some time to time. And, uh, and also I, I've seen uh, people, I, I, some, sometimes been lying awake at night, worrying themselves half to death because they think that something I think is perfectly okay <laughs> is, um, it, it is somehow contravened by some particular line, a line of the Bible. Now, firstly, I want to say that 
we all are different. We see things differently. That's why I read the body of Christ. And uh, I would not be one to say I've got the monopoly on the truth on this. OK. Um, but when it comes to um, one of the issues here, I, I, uh, there's, uh, there's a place I tend to go uh, as, uh, as for helpful insight. OK, so here's the issue with the Oxford AstraZeneca virus. As some have pointed out, so that's why I'm raising it. They said, are you aware that some fetal cells are used in the manufacturing of it? Um, and so the answer to that is, yes, I am aware of that. But let me just explain what's happened here. Uh, what would be, I think, um, uh, would be causing a massive, 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 massive uh, problems every day of the week. The Pope would be making announcements on it. I mean, you can guarantee on when it comes to pro-life and fetuses and embryos, the Catholic Church has traditionally been very vocal on these things. And they have a lot of a lot of theologians who wrestle all kinds of different medical ethical issues to the ground. And what's interesting is the comparative silence on this. And this is the reason why. The embryo, there are some embryo cells that ha have been used at some point. They were extracted, it seems, from a one or two fetuses that were um, that, that uh, were destroyed, uh, legally destroyed, uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, they were destroyed um, about 50 years ago. That's five zero years ago or 60 years ago, a long, long time ago. Tiny numbers of cells were taken and popped in a chest tube and grown. And they were grown in such a way that the cells themselves changed character somewhat. So that it became what we call is immortalized. They became a bit like um, yeast. Uh, if you think of yeast, you know, you grow yeast in a fridge, you want to uh, um, make some bread, uh, you, you mix it up with the, with, the, with the bread and the reaction happens. But if you keep on feeding the yeast and keeping it in your fridge, that yeast could go on making bread for you for a hundred years, um, so long as the cells are, 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 are maintained and looked after. And that's what they are. They're very simple cells. Um, they, they are um, in some ways not particularly recognizable compared to the cells that they were originally in the cell line. And they've been grown, uh, uh, or sometimes you can freeze them and then frost, defrost them and grow them again, but they've been grown basically uh, for 50 to 60 years now. Now, this particular line of cells has been used, uh, maybe Christians didn't realize this, but in many of the vaccines that members of your own family have, may have had in the past. Um, it could be, you know, the measles vaccines, or all kinds of vaccines have been, have been um, uh, created in the same way. What's happened is that these, this line of cells has been infected with a, um, with a virus and they've been programmed to make uh, virus particles which are defective they can't make you sick okay and and just like brewing beer in a vat uh, with yeast um, these cells have been fed and you get a great big vat that's full of cells and these cells have produced virus particles the virus particles then strained off and are separated from the cells and they're put in sterile solution and what you're given is virus particles but those virus particles have been grown in embryonic cells. That is for uh, many, um, uh, say for many a Catholic bishop has been a point of issue. So some Catholic bishops in Australia, for instance, wrote to the government and they said, uh, are you aware that there may be many different ways to make a vaccine? Uh, we are uncomfortable with this particular method um, and we hope and pray that uh, you will fund other methods. Uh, what uh, happened before, and, uh, you see, the thinking has been done a long time ago. Um, uh, the various uh, sort of theological institutes within the Catholic Church, when faced with this question several years ago, um, came to the conclusion, it wasn't like a sort of, they, they didn't feel, they, they, actually, the ethical issues they felt, and indeed the many evangelical theologians would feel the same, um, are um, uh, perhaps more subtle than one might think. Uh, the argument has been that if fetal cells had been, um, you know, there'd been a great hunger, uh, you know, a great desire to go off to abortion clinics and get fetal cells and, and experiment. I mean, the last three years, you know, there's been a great frenzy of extracting fetuses, trying to get hold of fetuses. Uh, there'd be something absolutely horrific about 
uh, the situation from the point of view of many, many, uh, many people who, um, as I do, have a great, uh, the deepest respect for for the unborn. Um, but given that this was a single act, that it happened 50 years ago, that that act has already taken place. There's no further acts or that 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 has an, has an ethical issue attached to it. That act happened, and given that it's an act um, uh, of injustice or whatever it is whatever words you want to describe to it, an unethical act. Uh, but if, as a, if, if it was the case, I'm not saying it is, but if it was the case, that the only way in which, let us say, a million people's lives could be saved would be by using um, a, um, redeeming in some way, some positive outcome from that act even if you think it should never have happened, then perhaps it would be morally justifiable. So uh, that is why the Pope has been very silent on it. Now, I'm not saying that you, 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 uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, you, uh, you might say, well, I, I don't take my theological positions from the Pope, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm just saying that the Catholic Church has had a very, very strong pro-life ethic and the Catholic Church itself is being um, quite subtle in its pronouncements on this. Um, I, I, with, I think the conviction that if there is an alternative way to do this, we have a duty to find it. But if there really isn't, then we may be faced with a great dilemma. So uh, there have been various announcements made by various bishops that um, to their parishioners that if Catholics were to decide through conscience not to have and say, for example, an Oxford an AstraZeneca type of vaccine, then they would have a moral duty to exclude themselves otherwise from risk of infection for the sake of their children, their families, their grandparents and the wider community. That is to quarantine themselves or, or to do whatever the steps. So these are really serious matters when we have a vast population at risk, because I, I'm going to come on to the challenge that if we don't contain this. Um, uh, so the second, one is uh, the the Pfizer Moderna one, the uh, the RNA mRNA one. Again, I've got some interesting questions here. People say DNA is the is like the, you know the word of God. It's the it's the it's the language of life. You know, do we have have we been given the God given right to rewrite rewrite our genetic code? Um, I I don't think we have, but I'm not sure that's what we're talking about. In fact, I'm sure we're not. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I was recently, well, until a few, a few years ago, chairman of a company that was taking human viruses, actually the virus causing cold sores, a relatively mild disease, and fixing them with new genetic code so they would infect cancers and destroy them. How cool is that? Now, I predicted in 1993 that so many viruses make us sick. How cool to train a virus to make us well or to cure disease. And so, so that company built viruses to, and, uh, and, uh, with, with fantastic results in animals and uh, some quite promising results too, with some kinds of tumors in humans. Um, so, so we've been building viruses uh, to do what? Uh, this virus works by uh, targeting the outside of human cancer cells, uh, um, injecting, uh, genetic code into the cancer cells and playing a trick on the cancer cell and hijacking it to turn it into a virus factory. And the, the virus will then be reproduced inside the cancer cell, it blows the cancer cell apart and then infects its neighbors and so it goes on. Quite honestly, I thought that was a very neat trick. I would be much more worried about changes that were um, getting transmitted to the next generation, uh, somehow getting built into the fabric of life, you know, um, into sperm or eggs. But, uh, but you know, when you're just reprogramming a few cancer cells and blowing them apart, I'd say, I think that's cool. Um, and if I'm reprogramming a few muscle cells in the, in the arm of a grandmother of yours and teaching those muscle cells to make fragments of a virus that it can't infect anybody, but they trick her immune system into thinking she's been infected, I think that's kind of cool. I have no problem with that theologically at all. Um, so 
Um, and by the way, you know, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories going around. I don't know where some people. So I'm not. I mean, absolutely. I, so I'm, to be honest, I would be laughing if, the, if, they, if, 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 if it wasn't for the fact that some people seem to believe this stuff. You know that somehow there's some chip in a vaccine that's going to go in someone's brain. It's going to be the mark of the beast. I mean. Give me strength. I mean, you know, uh, 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 these are like these are like the theories that people never walked on the moon. That it was a great sort of NASA con. That all the videos were made up. That the that all the videos were taken in in a NASA laboratory or in a, sp a space hangar. That uh, uh, no, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, I tell you, the same people tried to tell same kind of conspiracy theorists tried to tell me that HIV didn't cause AIDS. Oh my goodness, what a terribly 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 dangerous thing that was uh, i had i had to battle with one of the british newspapers the sunday times actually because they continued to print front page stories that hiv didn't cause aids that aids was not caused by a virus oh my goodness so we need to be very careful i showed those in, those glasses right at the beginning it's easy to be blind jesus criticized the leaders of the day because they didn't know how to interpret the signs of the times please don't let jesus criticize us for somehow interpreting vaccines as a method of injecting chips into humans' brains, folks. <laughs> okay, so let's just uh, be careful about that. Um, okay, so that's a slightly muddy answer. mRNA, I don't see a problem with that at all. I do see one big problem practically though. Guess how much it costs? Up to 28 pounds of go. Uh, the uh, the Astra AstraZeneca one is only three pounds of go. That's the one, uh, now, you might say, well, we can afford 28 pounds. Well, you might think you can afford it, but my friends in Zimbabwe can't, and the president of the country can't. And there's another problem with the, the Pfizer Modena one. It has to be kept at minus 80 degrees centigrade, all the way from the moment it's made to the moment it's mixed up. Ah, well, you might say, yes, I've got a freezer in my house. Yeah, you have. But have you been, have you, have you, I mean, I wish you'd come with me on a, on a, on a, on a mission trip to the remote rural Zimbabwe or Congo, where you find the electricity is off for six or eight hours a day, where you're lucky to find an ordinary fridge, let alone a massive freezer, where, um, you know, lorries break down, uh, things sit on the tarmac. Uh, I, I can tell you, uh, my, 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 my worry would be that someone could spend a billion a billion pounds delivering that kind of vaccine to the whole of Africa and three quarters of it will be delivered by wonderfully trained doctors and nurses under the fantasy that it still works and they're just injecting salty water because there's not a single thing left in it by the time it actually reaches the people who need it. So which brings me to another issue. You see, we can take a moral position, say, oh yes, we won't bother to get vaccinated or we don't need vaccines, we'll just sort of build up immunity or we'll find another way. The trouble is, my friends, there's a stark reality here. You know, I showed you um, that, you know, we've had what, maybe 50, 60 million detected infections so far. How many people live in the world? 7.8 billion. Well, maybe, maybe possibly if we've missed a whole load of infections, maybe half a billion people have had COVID. That is 7.2, 7.3 billion people whose immune systems are absolutely vulnerable right now. My friends, we're already seeing mutations. We've just seen it jump into mink. Thank goodness it happened in Denmark, which had the capacity to suddenly kill 70 million animals. What would happen if a mutant like that had suddenly jumped into, let's say, I don't know. Um, we know. We know that COVID infects tigers. It infects lions. It infects cats. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to jump from cats into humans. It infects dogs. It doesn't seem to jump from dogs into humans. I'm saying the writing is there on the wall. There are huge risks in allowing this thing to just sort of burn its way out around the world. If we, because the, 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 it's a real risk that it will come back and bite us in a much more savage form next year or the year after. So we have a moral duty uh, to take care of our own health, to wear those masks, to take care of the health of those around us, those we love, those in our churches, in our congregations, in old folks' homes and the rest. And we have a moral duty to do what we can to contain the spread in the poorest parts of the world. So we, we need to be campaigning for, um, for, I think, rapid scaling up a vaccine, uh, for making this thing, these things available to the nations that can't afford it. These are huge, huge issues, I believe, for the future of humankind. I think it's me out on vaccines, probably. <laughs>
Um, a couple, a couple ancillary questions have come in, so maybe we'll just try these two before we move on to a new topic. Um, one is more governmental policy, which is they, the, the, the person who's asking the question would like to know your point of view on should vaccines be made compulsory or not. And oh. then, then second, the second question that came in is um, in, in the final vaccination, are there nanoparticles of the human embryo that was no, uh, from 50 no, years? No, absolutely not. Nothing. Nothing. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, you, you, I mean, things have to be fantastic. You, you wouldn't believe the amount of, 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 of technology that goes into making vaccines. It is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, and, uh, and the technology that's been used is, more, is a thousand times more sophisticated than the technology that took human beings to the moon. That's the most amazing thing, you know. Um, so absolutely not. But on the, on the first question, should we have compulsory? You see, again, Christians, we love doing this. See, every time we, we come to a moral answer, we say we should, oh yes, make it illegal, you see. <laughs> Anything we tend to agree with, we make it illegal. Anything we think should, we should have to happen, we make it forced on everybody. It's the law, you know, you've got to do it. Um, and we Christians tie ourselves up in knots because, see, the trouble is I always feel sorry. You see, my wife's the magistrate, so she, <laughs> she has to deal with these things. You make something illegal, and then the next thing you have is some, someone says, I'm not doing that. They can put me in prison. And then you find that Sheila's got a magistrate a case before her is someone who says, well, I'm a Catholic and I didn't want any of this vaccine, so I, I, I'm refusing it, you see. And they said, well, I'm sending you to prison 30 days. Do you think she'll want to do that? No way. Do you think that if, so the person says, I want to be tried by a jury. So they go to a jury, you get 10 or 12 women, men and women. Do you think those 10 or 12 women, are, are men and women are going to convict this person? Convicted, guilty, send them to jail for 30 days. No, they'll let them off. And the judge will say, you have no, no choice. The facts are before you. There's only one verdict, which is they're guilty. Right, go, go and have your lunch and tell me what your verdict is. See? And they come back and say, not guilty, my Lord. <laughs> Why is that? Because if they think the law is an ass, they don't convict. I'm just saying we need to be sensible about these things. Do you really think, um, so, then, so then, okay, so person comes out of prison after 30 days, come up before the magistrate. You're going to have your jab now, are you? Say, uh, yes, my Lord. They get into the clinic I said, and then they say, no, no, no. And then the security guards have to hold them down. They have to shackle them. And this, this, this patient screaming, they're being assaulted by a needle. Can you imagine this happening all over the UK? I can't. So you can see why a lot of the debates you have about what's legal or illegal or what should, they break down just because of common sense. The only way to vaccinate a population is not by telling doctors to become basically army soldiers firing darts with vaccine into people's bottoms from a great distance, but it's, it's a common sense. It's saying, listen, folks, we believe it's your moral duty to be vaccinated for you, for your children, uh, for your community, for all you love and for your wider world. And let's do this together. And you don't need everybody to do it. Two thirds, I'd be very happy with. Um, so that's on, that's on the legal side. Um, uh, what was the other one? Yeah, that, those, those are the additional questions that came in on the vaccine. Okay. But uh, maybe so, somewhat related, Patrick, but uh, someone asked a slightly wider question for, of you as a Christian. Um, the, the question was more around, not just with the vaccine, but with, in general, with our response to um, what's happened in the last seven or eight months around COVID. The question was, have we come to the end of democracy? And what hope does the church have to influence when the approach by everyone else seems to be just survival? Yes, I, I, I read this question. It's a very thoughtful one. And I thank you. Um, uh, I'm just initials K and A. I thank you for sending it in. Um, uh, firstly, on, on democracy, uh, you know, we do live in strange times and our world is thinking strange thoughts. And uh, I think that our world has become more polarized, more extreme, more emotional in lockdown. It has done strange things. You know, I had a thousand doctors and nurses on a call the other day, just like this. And I could see them all in batches of 50. And I said, wave your hands to me if you are more emotional at the moment in lockdown and or everything's happening. And 70 to 80% said yes. You know, COVID has made us uh, uh, caricatures, more colorful versions of what we really are normally. 
Um, and yes, this has affected democracy. Um, but I would say this, that I don't know where the question lives, but in my country, I'm, I'm so glad to live in the, in the UK because I believe we have a democracy that is working. You may, you may not approve of all the policies that are going on. And I'm glad I can say to you that I believe that all the political parties are behaving responsibly, uh, carefully, thoughtfully, um, and respectfully in helping uh, our nation navigate this together. Um, and in the United States, we've had one of the most polarized and bizarre elections that has ever taken place in the nation's history because it's not been based on fact. It's been based on a whole kind of other, whole loads of other stuff that people believe, but that seems quite often to be disconnected from some of the realities that are going on. Um, and um, we can debate the reasons for that, but I'll just say this, an election did take place. Um, the voting seemed to happen in a, in, in, a, in a clear way. There's been a, a vetting of it and there has been a result and there will be a government that is, has been elected by a majority of the people in that nation. Um, uh, I think of other areas of the world which have become more autocratic or have um, the outward appearance of democracy, but not the function of it. And I think of our dear brothers and sisters in countries like Belarus at the moment, a nation that is really struggling. And if you don't know what's going on there, I, I was I search on Twitter on Belarus and just have a look and, uh, at what's happening there and, and look at uh, big news feeds like CNN and BBC. Um, so we have had a democracy that's been contested in a similar way to President Trump contesting, but uh, re refusing to, uh, uh, well, I, I was a very, uh, a democracy, a, a supposed democracy, but actually the voting process itself appeared to be manifestly and grossly corrupt. And the result of that election, I contested by just about uh, m m most, most of the governments of the world, as far as I can see, but uh, violence on the streets uh, against passively protesting um, individuals, and that's been going on for over 100 days. We have other nations that have become more autocratic versions of their own uh, democracies, uh, 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 like Turkey. So um, yes, that's true, but, but actually democracy continues to have a great future. What hope has the church to make its influence felt in a world that seems to be concerned only for its own survival? Actually, I think I've given my own answer to that. Yes, it's true that a lot of people, have, you know, we saw this, you know, people buying loot paper and to hell with everybody else type thing, you know. Uh, but actually, we've seen we've seen a uh, hundred trillion tiny acts of human kindness in the UK alone, on a you know, daily basis, day by day, the little things that have helped the world go around and help people understand that there is more to life than a virus. And I thank God for that. Um, and I believe that the church has a huge amount to say to that. And indeed has a brain, a great engine for it and a great stimulus of it. Um, I had another part of this question actually, which I think I've also answered a bit wrong, which is how can the church call back the authority delegated to it by our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, there, I see, I was thinking about that before the call began and I was thinking, well, do we mean authority over personal lives? Do we mean state authority? Um, if the church to call back authority, it implies that, you know, we're back to laws again, you know, how can we make sure that the laws are the right ones in our nation? But um, as I've said, the law is a very blunt instrument with which to regulate things, actually, um, whether it's, you know, sexual behavior in the bedroom or it, it just, it, it, it's, it's not an ideal tool um, uh, for many things that actually need to come from the heart. It's hard to legislate for human kindness. It's easier to legislate for, for cruelty, against cruelty, than to legislate for kindness. Um, uh, and the church, I believe, will, uh, will uh, find its authority grows life by life, conversion by conversion, disciple by disciple. Uh, you know, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world and the darker the world, the brighter the light. Uh, and uh, you only need one tiny match ignited in a cave and it blinds everyone with the light. We are salt. You don't need much to salt the whole world. And uh, um, I, 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 I won't go any further on that, but I can give you many examples. I, I tell you this, let me tell you a secret <laughs> that uh, the chairman of, of many of the largest corporations in the world uh, lie awake at night before annual general meetings 
of their shareholders. And they're not lying awake at night because of the institutions or the pension funds who own 70% of their shares. They like awake at night because of, they fear some 28 year old postgraduate student is going to turn up at the shareholder meeting having bought one share for 11 pounds and ask one single question, which is so incredibly embarrassing that it makes a headline almost instantly and goes viral. Um, and you know, if you're if you're a, f- a shoe manufacturer, it's probably. Um, please, can you co- please can you comment how many other factories there are like the one that I'm going to name now on this piece of paper? I have photographs of children working in this factory. There are three of those children outside. They would like to meet you. In fact, I'm coming down this bridge, bring them now. These children are working in your factories. I flew them in for this meeting. Would you like to meet them, Mr. Chairman? Would you like to tell us how many other children are working in the? Rest? You know, oh. Ah! I tell you, I tell you this, you don't need many Christians to help change the world. <laughs> you, I mean, really, it's not through law, it's through people movements, it's through the greater Thunbergs of this world, who are saying things that, that resonate uh, because they're true and they appeal to that inner, that sense of inner rightness that is actually inside us. Uh, that natural conscience, if you like, that Paul talks about in the early chapters of Romans, um, that um, because we somehow you know, we are fallen creatures, but we were made in the image of God. And there is, there is, there is, there is uh, things that are true and right and noble, they resonate. And that's what I found over and over again in the media and things like that. When you say things that, um, you know, people say, you know what, he's right. It's right, that is, that is right. And what's more, it's good. <laughs> And, and that, that, I believe, has greater moral force in terms of church influence than passing any number of draconian laws, you know, uh, forcing people to attend church on a Sunday or forcing them to remain married even when they want to kill each other. <laughs> I just, you know, I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm praying for, is people movements, movements of faith that will transform whole societies one life at a time. So maybe, thank you for that, Patrick, maybe somewhat related. Um, What's your point of view? Is this the great reset? I think you saw this in your questions that came to you before. Yeah, I did. Yeah. If someone could explain to you what the great reset is, I could answer the question. What is the great reset, Ron? I, I'm not sure what the person is asking, but I guess what they're, if, if, if I can put it in my own words, what they're saying is, is this where we are restarting all over again in a new environment? Yes. As Christians, totally new, new fights, you know, is, is this it? Is this it? Is this like... Well, yes and no. Um, I don't know whether this is good news or bad news. To, it depends on people's perspectives. Some people think, oh, this is the end times. Okay, I'll come back to that one. Okay. Um, we live in Weymouth now, and outside my window, I can see the harbour. because We love the sea. I can see the harbour. And I can tell you, in that harbour, I think it was in 1400 something, there'll be some historian who tells me I got the date wrong, but the plague came in to the UK and half the population of Weymouth died. And we think now, we thought it was originally a quarter of the UK population, but scientists now think it was half the UK's entire population died because of the plague. So there's nothing, and, 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 and when that happened, you can imagine how many people thought it was the end times. So I'm saying that plagues, these are nothing new. This is actually quite a mild one compared to some now, I've talked about AIDS. Is, is AIDS, was AIDS the end times? No. Um, there have been lots of earthquakes recently. Does that mean it's the end times? I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's easy to say. Obviously. All I know is that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, the Bible teaches us to, 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 to value every day. And uh, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough problems of its own. <laughs> I, I said, don't be anxious. But there's a sense in which we we are we are we are here for now. We 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 are we we need to give account for each day of our lives. And I see so many Christians are so caught up with what might be going to happen. Yeah, it's fine to be a futurist. I'm a futurist. I make a living out of making predictions about trends. But but when it's sort of well, you know what? I've, 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 you know, we can get to all kinds of positions. Like we don't need to worry about plastic in the oceans. So well, why is that? Well, plastic will. I know it won't break down for a million years, but who cares? You know. I mean, the Lord's coming back in 30. <laughs> okay, well, you better be sure. <laughs> so, I, I'm gonna, sorry, Patrick, I'm going to bring one of our panelists, uh, Michelle, okay. because she's just dropped us a note here. The Great Reset is actually a report 
that oh, uh, okay. earlier on this year. And Michelle, maybe you could just summarize really briefly. Yeah, it's a proposal by the World Economic Forum to rebuild the econo economy sustainably following COVID-19 um, pandemic. It was um, unveiled in May by Prince Charles and the, the World Economic Forum. Um, it's been criticized for using the pandemic to implement a risky experiment and a petition to stop it gained eight, 880,000 signatures in less than 72 hours. Okay. And the conspiracy theory has now attached to it, uh, claiming it will be used to bring socialist and environmental changes and the supposed new world order. Okay, well, uh, here, here's what I'm seeing, something a little different. So here, here's, here's a, a picture of the world. And I, I, I love globes um, because actually, they help us to understand what it means when the, the Lord holds the world in the palm of his hand. And the most amazing thing is this, I can tell you a truth, that the world is still turning. It may be surprising to some Christians, they think the world has come to an end, but it is still turning and actually has continued to turn. And the biggest trends in the world that I've described for companies and churches over the last 30 years are continuing to dominate our world. Um, what's happened is that some of those trends have speeded up. Um, so... Uh, for instance, the transition from terrestrial shopping to online, you know, it was happening anyway, you know, we walked past shopping centres and I used to think, well, I think they'll be gone by 2025, now I know they'll be gone by 2021. That's nothing new, it's just a, an acceleration. Or um, uh, people thinking, I might get an electric car, you know what, I think I probably should, then now definitely going to do that. Uh, governments that have watched the, the, the street air clear for the first time in generations, um, who were anyway going to say, well, it's going to be illegal to buy a new diesel car by 2040. They've woken up one morning and said, hey, why did we do it 2030? Um, is that new? No, no. I mean, for, for, I mean, uh, I, and I work with many car manufacturers for the last 10 years, they, they've been placing huge, huge bets, huge investments, knowing for an absolute certainty that uh, nearly all cars sold uh, by a certain date will be electric. It's the only debate is by when, was it 2040 in Paris or 2030 in Paris that most new cars would be electric or maybe 2032. So what's, what's happened is speed of change has, 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 has for some of these trends has changed, but not the direction of them. Um, so yes, it's been a kind of reset, but not as profound as, as, as I think has, has, has been imagined. And the same with home working. Is the whole world going to work at home forever? I don't think so. I should think some people on this call are absolutely thrilled at the thought of being able to get out of their homes and go back into an office because some people on this call may well have young children at home. They haven't, they've been trying to do Zoom calls in their, own, in their, in their bedroom at, at, during the day and then they worry, they worry they can't sleep at night because the bed has never cooled down. It's been, it was hot during the night, it was hot during the day because they was lying on bed doing all their work because it's the only place in the house they could do their work. You know, we need to be really realistic that and human beings are still human beings. The greatest uh, part of being a human being from the sociological point of view is that we're community people. We were designed as social creatures. We were designed to belong, to be parts of tribes and families and communities and neighborhoods, to be part of churches and, and small groups and, and, uh, and all the rest. And of course, COVID has robbed us of much of that. Have we, have, we, have we had a reset so we don't need each other anymore? No, we still need to gather. We are programmed together. We have this, this uh, instinctive desire to be together, to, whether it's in football stadiums or in celebration events to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. These things endure. So I, I would say that I think the world will be less changed than many imagine in the longer term, but we will get to a number of trends uh, will we'll progress much more quickly. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, let me just come in on here and let take a little time check. We've got about five, five or 10 minutes left um, or, or, on this session. So I'll ask you to focus on the, the stuff that remains to be done. And then, uh, Patrick, once we have um, uh, um, finished the live stream, Patrick will be available in, in the Zoom room for a little while longer for, for further chat. Um, but I wanted to come in on this because we're doing a lot of work right now, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the national leaders of Elam, and we've been discussing this uh, um, at national level, also local church level, thinking about what, what, what are the implications for what we've seen and experienced in a positive way, the positive sides of it as well, 
um, what are those implications for, for future life on ch in church? Now, some of the things that you pointed out earlier was that, that there's been far more engagement, online engagement, and, and the, the reach is, is, has extended. There's been a tremendous release of believers who are caring for other believers and people doing the community work. Some of the million people that volunteered for the NHS, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Distribution of Food has become uh, much more much more pronounced. Um, people taking care of each other, our cell groups, we're a thorough cell, thoroughgoing cell church, the care, the lay leadership, all those things are positive. The use of technology where we realize now we're quite ridiculous in expecting everybody to be at every meeting, even the, the, the more um, uh, management type meetings in person and so on. We could never have done this as easily we did without, without technologies, all those positives. So just as anything else that you think would be useful for us to put into the mix as we reconsider life after COVID and how we take the church forward. Yeah, well, I, I think there's going to be a great hunger together, actually. I think on the rebound, you know, I think people might have thought to themselves, you know, if there was a local football stadium that was booked for a big, you know, great big celebration, would I have gone? Well, after COVID, I will. <laughs> Just, just to, just to say, just to, just to shout in the face of COVID and say, "There, you didn't get us after all," and just to celebrate this newfound freedom. I, I, I think we'll, I think we will see quite a lot of things happen on the rebound like that. Um, yes, of course, there'll be casualties along the way. People got got out of the habit of meeting with, meeting together with believers, but there will also be others. You know, um, our own church. Uh, we have we have welcomed a significant number of new members during COVID, during lockdown. We've, we've never met them, <laughs> but they're dying to meet us. <laughs> they're joining home groups virtually. They're local people. They've just moved into the area. Um, so uh, one of the things I think we, we will become is more distance agnostic. What do I mean by that? It's a bit, um, in the past, our ministries were so limited to how far you could drive to a meeting, really. And if, you want, if you're going to go green, then how far you walk or bike. Um, so, but with, with, uh, with this Zoom technology and other platforms like it, we realize actually that what blessings there are to transcend a, a city boundary or even a national one. Uh, I, I mean, the ability to just zone in ministers from all around the world into a meeting is just sensational and to think we've had these tools but we never use them and so many of my corporate clients have completely rethought how they're going to do um, teams in the future um, uh, and they uh, just because they've had all these tools and never never bothered to use them and I think as you say yourself it's going to be the same with, ch with church leaders as well for instance say, do we I know there's uh, three of us have got to come up from Southampton and one down from Nottingham, but why can't they join us by Zoom tomorrow and the rest of us will just meet in the, in, 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 in the, in the church office? And we'll see a lot more of that, I think. So it'd be very interesting, but um, I think the physicality is going to continue to be very, very important. Hospitality. Okay. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll go off now and um, Ron, just take through any, any final questions and at 7.30, um, we, we will um, finish the live stream and just go on briefly yep. with-, with um, And I'm happy to linger. If there's a couple of people want to chat, if it's a hundred, that's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Ron, over Delighted. to you. Thank you. Thank so you for inviting me, absolute pleasure. And many of the all your ministry. Yeah, Thank many you. of the questions are related to some of the things you've spoken about before. But uh, someone's just asking for a little bit more on your point of view on the Bill, Ga Bill Gates microchip containing the vaccine implant. I know you touched on that before, but it'd be good to again hear from you on that. Okay. And then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, just on, on the on the microchip implant, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know where, I don't know who dreams these things up. I, I really don't. Um, but uh, in our social media world, things rapidly become fixed into people's minds. Um, and as I said, back in when HIV started, it was, oh, it was all came out of a, you know, I don't know, some Soviet laboratory and it was all a deliberate attempt to wipe out humankind or something. I mean, it's just, uh, all I can tell you is uh, that, um, but you see, the trouble is once a conspiracy, it's all about trust or rather lack of it. You see, um, if people don't trust people in government and they don't trust chief medical officers and they don't trust the doctors in the hospital and they don't trust their GP and they don't trust their church leaders, 
then actually I, I'm probably going to waste my time trying to answer this question because why should they trust me? But all I can say is, and, 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 and uh, all I can say is, I can absolutely guarantee to you that it would be impossible. <laughs> I mean, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> I really do, <laughs> because then we could program people for human goodness. All we do is give them a vaccine, then we could treat their brains and they say, hello, good morning. When they want to kill someone, they say, hello, good morning. And they do a nice, nice, give them a nice hug instead of throttling them. You know, I wish it was that easy. Honestly, I really do. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but it just isn't. Um, we don't have the tech. Uh, you know, we, we, I can tell you, we, we are able to implant chips inside people's heads. Uh, 500,000 have them inside their heads at the moment. 450,000 are connected to the, the hearing nerve and it's restored their hearing, okay? Uh, it's a little device, it's connected to a microphone or, um, and it broadcasts radio waves to hear and it stimulates the nerve. And a, a friend of mine, it's amazing, she said, I had it done, I was completely deaf all my life. I got this little thing in and suddenly, no one told me that the lift goes ting and you, when, you, when it comes to the wall, it goes ding. Isn't that clever? <laughs> and it's amazing to hear for the first time. Now, please don't tell me that's the mark of the beast. You know, that's just, that's not even a chip in the brain. 50,000 people have chips in their brain worldwide, uh, but they are because they have had terrible accidents. Their necks are completely broken, they're paralyzed, and the chips enable them to, to think, they can find a way to communicate with that chip. It's a very primitive thing, but. And, and, and it means the light, light turns off and they can go to sleep, or it means that they can summon some help or something like that. I think that's a jolly good thing. I, I tell you, the, the, the amount of technology required to put a single chip inside someone's head who's paralyzed from the neck down. I mean, you're talking about, you know, 20,000 pound operation, you're talking about massive issues. The thought if someone just being able to inject it into your body and all of a sudden it happens, it's unbelievable. It's, it's impossible. There are no chips inside these things. You, they would be visible if they were. Um, these samples have to be strained. Um, um, uh, they're passed through fil the vaccine fluid is passed through filters anyway. Um, it's, it's absolute no, 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 no. It is not true. But of course, those who um, don't believe me, um, well, I don't know where to go now. <laughs> I don't know who to recommend to see. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And I just I'll take a final question here. And then remember, as Colin said, if you have further questions and you'd like to dialogue with Patrick for a little bit longer, we're here at the end of the webinar. So by all means, stay in here. We can chat a little bit more. But I, I've scanned the questions and more or less we've hit most of it. Um, some of you are asking for much more detail on some of the answers, and we can certainly do that after. But this one is more asking your point of view on something, Patrick. It's uh, with respect to the vaccination and what happens after. So particularly in if we get ourselves into the situation where individuals are prohibited from services, not church services, but services in general, um, if they choose to not have the vaccination. Um, I I can't see that would happen for the reasons I've described. You know, the law is a blunt, you know, again, you know, I think of, of, of magistrates and juries. So, you know, someone says, it's my human right to be able to go to church. He says, no, nope, it's not. I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm going in. No, nope, not without a vaccine, you're not. Um, I just can't see that happening because if you do, see, the chances are, if it, say London, uh, it's probably, probably the case that over half of London has got some antibody exposure antibodies already, or they've got some T cell immunity already. It may, it may fade, but they've got some. And we vaccinate, um, you know, and you go and vaccinate 60% of London as well. Um, and then some people have got kids at home with, with snotty colds and they've probably acquired a little bit of immunity that way. Some people may just be naturally immune. Um, I mean, the virus will have nowhere to go. It, you, you, it's a bit like, um, uh, uh, if you've ever tried, ever tried to make a wood a, a wood fire to try and cook something in a little wood clearing or, or something like that, you know, if you don't have enough dry tin, tinder and, and other twigs, or of this, or the, or the embers are spread too wide, the fire goes out. So it's the same with the virus. Unless, unless there's enough heat in the virus to connect to other pieces of timber and get them smoking, it basically dies out. Um, so yes, we'd have occasional cases and little clusters and things like that. But the main strength of, of, of this pandemic would have gone. And, and I, I, I don't think that people legislate that for. Okay, well, thank you so much, Patrick. It's 
brilliant having you with us. Thank and you. we appreciate the fact that you could be hanging around a little bit at, at the yeah. end as well for those who choose to stay with uh, us. Just, yeah, and just to say, um, if, they, if you want more, I just posted, I posted another article today on uh, my website. The website is, if you remember, it's, it's global, that's like the world, and change, it's still turning, okay? So it's globalchange.com. And on there, you'll find a lot of a lot of questions answered about COVID. There's a, there's quite a lot of uh, videos that I've done of sessions like this and other resources. Um, there's also my my phone number, my link. Can you hear me there? Twitter, own for, it's my actual mobile phone number. It's, just, it's my phone number. To, oh my word, it's ringing now. <laughs> it's my mobile phone number. So uh, um, please be kind. 15 million other people on that. It, literally, there have been 15 million people who've used that website and they've all got access. So if I don't answer immediately or I miss your LinkedIn post, um, just wait three days and repeat. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to continue the conversation. I'll, I'll just do what I can to help if I can. Thank you. Back, back to you, Colin. Okay. Muted. You're, you're muted. You're Colin. muted, Colin. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that had to happen, yes. <laughs> I muted myself. That had to I'm glad happen. it's not just me that had the technology. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Patrick. You've done um, an amazing job of, of taking us over so much, so much territory uh, tonight. I just, um, be before we say goodbye to those watching on live stream, and we'll continue in, in the Zoom room uh, for a while, but uh, have you any idea um, from your point of view when we're going to be back to normal? And I mean normal, in other words, uh, with the, all the restrictions will be lifted. And, and would you see anything happening there? Would it be just like small communities being locked down? Or uh, there, there seems to be saying that by Easter, early summer, um, this will all be over. What do you think? I, I think uh, when the summer months come, you remember how we, we, we had a, a, an amazingly um, normally feeling type of summer, really, if you think about it. And that's partly weather, I think. There's lots of things that happen with sunlight that we don't understand. So Colin, I think that by the time we get to May, June, um, even if the world hasn't got quite normal, it, the summer months will really help us. The big test will be where we are in September next year. But I would hope that by then, there'll be enough people vaccinated and we'll have got on top of it. Um, and it won't, we won't have a world without COVID, but I believe we'll be much more back to normal. The things that will take more time, I think, will be um, probably um, things like uh, flying in, in big jets, um, cruise ships, uh, big football matches. Not just a question of regulation, but a question of trust. You know, you think how worried people are about there might be chips in, 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 the, in the vaccine. Well, that is not actually a particularly rational fear, but it is a very rational fear to think that actually there could be in a football stadium there might be a super spreader or two uh, next June and maybe I'll give the match a miss. So I, I think we'll see people being more cautious. It's so weird. I can, you know, I used to fly in planes maybe 50 times a year and that doesn't sound very green, but it was my job. Um, but, you know, I, I, I said to Sheila yesterday, I can hardly even get my head around the thought of getting, getting on a train to an airport. You know, there's going to need to be a certain amount of psychological readjustment. It's not just a question of whether we can, it's a question of whether we will feel like it. Yeah, well, that, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, at this point, we're going to say go goodbye to those who are watching us on live stream. There will be a version of this that we will release on KTTV, just on our normal platform. So those of you who, and many, many people are watching live stream, we'd love to to uh, spend more time with you. But anyway, we'll be back to this a little later. But and for now, how do we get goodbye. on the Zoom call? Well, how does this happen? Do we sort of drop automatically in or do we have to press a knob on our screens? No, I think I think you just stay there, Patrick, okay. and, and they will they will come in to you just All as right. we are. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is fun. This is great fun. So anyway, thank you very much for thank those you. who are watching on the live stream and uh, we'll say goodbye to you and we'll continue in the Zoom room. Thank you. Okay. God bless.